Welcome everyone. It's lovely to have you here this evening to our presentation by Sue Brunskill on uh, native grasses for residential gardens. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Lisette Salmon. I'm your facilitator tonight and I'm the project officer for Gardens for Wildlife, which is part of Wodonga Urban Land Care Network. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all zooming in from and pay my deepest respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to thank Albury City Council for their financial support. Without their assistance, we would not be, this would not be possible this evening. I would also like to thank Sue Gold, who is uh, from Wodonga Landcare, and she's working in a pro bono capacity tonight to provide us with IT support. If you need her assistance, her phone number, she's just waving there. Her phone number is um, next to her name. It was also in the email I sent out this morning. So the format is very straightforward this evening. I'm going to introduce you to Sue Brunskill in a moment, and Sue uh, is going to speak for 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, then we're going to go to questions, but they need to be delivered via me through the chat function. So please put your questions in the chat function. We're expecting 100 people this evening, so that was the best way to um, deliver the questions to Sue at the end of her presentation. And in the first instance, you might want to jump on to chat and tell us where you're from. The majority of you are from Albury Wodonga, but I know there are people all up and down the Eastern Seaboard as well, from as far north as Weeper in Queensland to the ACT and Melbourne. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sue Brunskill. Sue's been interested in plants and gardens all her life. She studied bush regeneration, horticulture, and park management and worked in all three fields. You might have heard her on the ABC local radio gardening show. She's an active member of Wurrigi Land Care. And Sue was a key author in this book, the Albury Wodonga Garden Guide, a key contributor. This book is available free, to, free of charge to Albury Wodonga residents via Albury and Wodonga Council. Just go to their customer service desk. Sue lives on a farm in Wurrigi with her husband. They've been there for 30 years, busily revegetating and creating a delightful habitat garden. It's a great honor to have you here, Sue, and now handing over to you. Thanks, Lizette, for that really warm welcome. Um, lovely to be here, although we all do know that Zoom scares the socks off us at times, um, and it would be lovely to be talking with you and seeing you in the real. But I certainly wouldn't be up at Weeper, although I'd like to. Um, so there are some benefits of Zoom. Um, and we just have to go with the flow. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Lizette, and uh, Gardens for Wildlife uh, for presenting, for organising this. Um, they do some uh, an amazing um, work in, in gardening for wildlife. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, it's really excellent to see so many people interested in using grasses in their gardens. They've sort of been a bit of a Cinderella, I think. Um, they've been used a lot in, um, in commercial gardens and landscaping, but not so much in residential gardens and in private gardens. So um, it's fabulous to see so many people interested in using them. Um, Gardens can be fantastic places for attracting wildlife. And wildlife makes gardens much more interesting. I'm sitting here on my southern veranda, looking out um, at, I've got lots of glass windows, and I, I watch each day the blue band bees in the salvia, and I've just watched the grey fantail. So gardens um, are much, much, much more interesting when they've got wildlife in them. Um, they can also play a huge role in conserving species. Uh, someone came to my place from Sydney and said, um, oh, you've got blue wrens. We used to have them all the time in Sydney. So even what we think is common is not necessarily common anymore. And gardens, particularly when there are um, a few similar sort of gardens nearby, can really make um, a huge impact on keeping our common species common. 
um, but also uh, potentially uh, for the rarer species. Um, we do have amazing wildlife in Australia, but sadly, we don't have a great record of keeping them. And so gardens can really play um, a great sort of, uh, can be very important to become that. We also can be totally self-focused and there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of information over the last maybe 10 years or so about the value of nature to people. Um, and I think it's become particularly obvious to lots of people now, particularly in COVID, where we've spent a lot of time inside. And a lot of people have found solace in getting out into nature. Um, so... Uh, yeah, gardens are really fabulous places for people and for our environment. Now, no matter what your garden looks like, it is actually an ecosystem, a collection of plants and animals living together somewhere. Um, even if you've got a garden that is very well maintained and very neat, um, it's still got animals living it, in it. However, we can actually make it much better very quickly for shelter. So for um, birds and animals to find shelter from predators, other birds and animals, um, we can attract insects. And uh, someone, Liz, I think is on tonight, was saying she's a real birdo and she's saying, oh, I'm really getting into insects now. Um, so gardens are great for insects for their own beauty and for their own role in, in what they do, uh, but also as food for, um, for other animals. Um, and we, they can be great places for homes for wildlife. So I've had some blue wrens nesting in a ratty bit of uh, garden that I haven't got to yet, that's grasses and sweet peas. Um, and they've died off and the blue wrens are nesting in there. So we can, um, uh, we can make it much better for wildlife very quickly. They also, uh, gardens also have a benefit for erosion, slowing water down, um, particularly if you use grasses, can help filter water. And we can design them for low water use. Not all our garden, it's really nice to have some areas that are, you know, that have got uh, moisture loving plants. But particularly with larger gardens, we can have a lot of areas that don't actually need any supplementary watering in summer, or maybe just the odd bit. Um, and we can also, uh, not going back to the 70s when, when people said native gardens don't need any work, um, we can actually design them for lower maintenance. Um, so uh, that's really, um, really important too. So using grasses in landscaping, uh, they're I think they, we need to look a bit more carefully because they aren't always necessarily big and bright and bold. Um, they have, they're often smaller and they often have really beautiful features that you don't actually see unless you go looking. So we've got some beautiful seed heads, this uh, Carex on the left. Lots of the sedges have beautiful seed heads. Uh, we can, uh, and the kangaroo grass, I've got a little bit to show you at the end. Uh, the grasses in landscaping can also be really good for, particularly in our southern areas around Albury Wodonga, because they're often bright green and in our very dry summers, uh, not so much this, this year, but in some of our other summers, it's actually really lovely to be able to look out and see a bit of green, particularly that lovely lime green colour. So um, they often stay green in summer and things like the kangaroo grass um, it can also stay green and microlina. So some of the grasses um, can stay green as well as the sedges. Um, they can also, they're adding different textures and colours. So instead of everything just all being one colour of green, we have lots of different greens. We have olive greens and lime greens and grey greens and blue greens. Um, and we have lots of different textures. So grasses actually provide a lot of different texture compared to a lot of our shrubs and trees. They're really useful as an edge and you can see down here the lamandra, this is lamandra longifolia, the mat brush. This is in my garden and on the left is just 
uh, it's actually a path that's overgrown with wallaby grass. We probably cut that about three times a year. And on the right is um, a garden with shrubs. So they can actually be really good edges as well. And seriously, you couldn't kill that lamandra if you tried, I don't think. So if you're a bit loose with the whippersnipper, as I can be at times, um, something like a big tough sedge can actually, or mat brush or dianella can actually be a really good um, edging. And it's sort of delineating different areas. They also can provide uh, contrast. So that little picture of the house up the top, you can see there's little low um, shrubs, but there's also some spiky, lovely, it looks like blue festuca or poa or something. Um, so some lovely contrast as well. And then we also seem to like repetition in, in landscaping. So uh, uh, grasses can be really good at providing that repetition. Um, the picture up the top right, that was me going walking this morning, just in the bush behind me, but the kangaroo grass was growing, the uh, microlina, the weeping grass, was growing in amongst the wallaby grass and it had the sun behind it. It was just beautiful. A really, the lovely lush green of the, of the weeping grass and the lovely seed heads of the wallaby grass. Really beautiful light and their sort of silhouette in the light was beautiful. And down the bottom left, this is showing how tough microlina is. This is also up in the bush, um, eaten by wallabies and kangaroos. But there it is, and I know we've had quite a bit of um, rain this year, but even in really poor rainfall summers, we'll still get the microlina surviving. So we, I did take a, a film, but I haven't uploaded it. I'm, I've been having internet problems today that I won't go into any further, um, but they are beautiful in the wind. So I had a photo, a video of that lamandra, the mat rush, some of those in the wind, and it's they are really beautiful and calming and lovely movement in the garden as well. So grasses have um, lots of different uh, values in landscaping, if you're right into landscaping, you know, beautiful garden. They can also be really useful for difficult places. Um, we've got in some damp areas, so the bottom right, is just on a roadside down near me. And that's the local Carex oppressor, the, um, the, what they call cutty grass here. So the, the leaves are actually quite sharp, but you can see that it's growing in not very nice water, um, but it's helping and it's, it grows in our paddocks here as well. Um, and so it's really good for um, wet areas where you don't really, you don't want to go and drain them, you don't want to do something with them. So planting some of the carex, the, the sedges and the poas can be really useful for difficult sort of wet areas or if you had a, a drain or something. Also excellent for tough areas. So the picture up on the top right is, um, is let me think, oh, windmill grass and red leg grass growing and you can see that's the side of the Wurugi Road. You can see it's facing north. It's such a difficult, difficult place, but there are the native grasses surviving. Um, so they are very tough and some of the grasses can be co put cover in places that nothing else will grow. Um, down the bottom left is a, a planting we did at Wurugi along the rail trail. We've been planting grasses and sedges and things along the rail trail. So we're delineating the edge of the creek um, and uh, planting them in rows. So they actually look like, some people still think all grasses are weeds. Um, so a bit of care with planting um, can also be really good. And even in uh, that uh, lamandra at the in the middle, that's in a very tough area with wood chip around it. So you can see that that doesn't need lots of water. So if we're planning our gardens, that we have some low area watering and some, we're going to keep our water loving plants in one area, probably closer to the hoses and to the farm, uh, to the, sorry, hoses and the house. 
then we can use some of these tougher plants in those areas. Some of the bigger blocks, particularly in Albury, say in West Albury, and some of the bigger blocks at Laguna, uh, they can, some of these native grasses really only get need uh, mowing a couple of times a year. So they can actually be really good as far as maintenance goes, not having to, I do have a little laugh when I see people sitting on their lawnmower every week. And I think that, um, yes, maybe some native grasses in there would save on, on, um, on some of your time spent there. Management, they can look weedy. Um, so sometimes we see grasses, this is the poa, poa lavalardieri, or the tussock grass that grows around here. It grows, it would have grown along the creeks um, and rivers around here. Beautiful big tussocky grass, but if it doesn't get maintained, it does look a bit weedy. And so these grasses actually grow from the base. And if you think about grasses in the ecosystem, they're eat, eaten by grazing animals. So they're actually really, they, 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 they need to be cut back. They need to be grazed, however you do it, with that, with a, a whippersnipper or with, I've got a broccoli cutter there and, I was trying to find it to wave around and show you. I've got this great Asian tool that is like a little, very sharp scythe that you can just grab the, if you've only got a small amount of native grass, you can just cut those or an old bread knife or something. So we do need every year to cut back that old growth. Um, so the seeds are all dropped and cut back the old growth. And if you cut it back just to you know, 10 centimetres or so, you will get a lovely new um, lush regrowth. There is an excellent uh, little video on how to prune native grasses and clumping plants. That's on Gardening Australia. So if you Google Gardening Australia, how to prune native grasses and clumping plants, um, that will come up with an excellent video. Just gotta check how I'm going. Um, so which grasses? Uh, there are lots of exotic ornamental grasses, um, particularly if you look at some of the um, overseas books on uh, designing uh, gardens with, with um, grasses. However, we do, and, and so those grasses you would find at um, some of the commercial nurseries. We do need to be a little bit careful that they don't become weedy. Um, and there is a a lovely grass that's been used madly in landscaping called Penicetum allopercuroides, and it has escaped in some areas. But I'm not going to talk about exotic grasses. There are lots of beautiful exotic grasses. I'm really just going to talk about um, our native grasses, particularly our local ones. We've got lots of wallaby grasses, though they used to be called, you probably know them as Dansonia. Um, lots of different species, probably about seven different species around here. Uh, they're great for attracting finches, and seed eating birds like rosellas and skinks and things. And one of the values of uh, these grasses is they're clumping grasses and they've got bare spaces. So something like a skink can get out in the sun but hide back in the clumping grasses. Now, I happen to know, I'm going to talk about where you can buy these plants but I happen to know that our native nursery in Wodonga has five different species of wallaby grasses in their nursery at the moment. So we'll talk about that a bit later. Weeping grass is a lovely, lovely grass. It's probably the one that you would think is exotic more than any of the other native grasses. Um, and you can look and see, it gets its name by those, you can see the weeping seed heads on those plants. Now is actually a perfect time to be collecting that seed. Um, around here, I've noticed, um, and it's very easy to collect that seed. You just run your hand along the seed head and the seeds come off in your hand. So uh, weeping grass is um, an excellent grass for, some people have uh, tried weeping grass lawns, um, and, but it's also an excellent grass for lots of wildlife. It does come back very quickly if there's a little bit of rain in summer. 
So it often stays green in summer, but it will come back really quickly with a little bit of watering. Now, I should just tell you, when these grasses are grown in gardens, they actually look a bit more robust and they often get bigger seed heads. So some of these pictures are ones of them out just in wild areas. Um, but often when you grow them in your garden, they actually are a bit lusher and um, a bit more lush and, and uh, you know, have more seed heads. So we've got, whoops, sorry, next one. Tussock grass, that's the one that I showed you before. These are all great uh, food for butterflies, but also for the larvae. We tend to forget that caterpillars actually turn into butterflies and moths. And if we're going to have butterflies and moths, we actually need to have the caterpillars. Um, and a lot of these native grasses are really good food for the caterpillars. The eggs are laid on the grasses. The caterpillars go down near the base in the daytime. And then at night time, they come out and eat. So um, tussock grass is a great one for um, caterpillars of a lot of our lovely uh, butterflies. And the same with kangaroo grass. Kangaroo grass is really widespread across Australia. And this is one of the grasses that looks so um, much lusher in a garden situation. Um, it also great for seed eating birds and peaches and carrots and things. The other thing that uh, grasses do is they attract in other insects and seed eating birds like great fantails, uh, scrub wrens and things, they will often be eating and blue wrens love the insects that grow on these, um, uh, on these grasses. A few more grasses. Uh, Phragmites is called common reed, but if you have, and it grows down along the rivers and creeks and an absolutely fantastic plant for erosion and habitat and a whole lot of things. But because it's called common reed, people often don't realise that this is a grass. It gets green in summer, dies back in winter. But if you have a little bit of a dam or a, a bit of water at your place, you could get some phragmites. Um, and things like frogs love living in there and great... Um, you know, quite a few birds live in there. Um, so it goes, grows quite tall. Uh, over on the right is foxtail spear grass, um, stipa densiflora. It's saying the flowers are very dense and they have these lovely big seed heads on them, uh, usually before Christmas, but maybe after as well. Now you can probably collect the seed of that. And this beautiful stipa elegantissima. And I've got some in my garden and when you're, as the sun's setting and your sun's setting behind it, it's just the most stunning, beautiful uh, plant. Um, it's got sort of hairy parts on the leaves and, it's, and it moves in the uh, light and it is really beautiful. And I do know that our native nursery has got seven plants, I think. And so you might beat me to it when it's open next, um, next Saturday. We also have what we'll call grass-like plants. So we've got the sedges um, and the rushes. So the sedges have edges and some of those can be quite sharp um, and they often have beautiful seed heads. And we've got rushes, so rushes are round. So the big, the, the ones that have the leaves that are round um, are the rushes. They're both great for moist areas. Um, and the one on the bottom right is the Carex oppressor, our tall sedge that grows. I've got lots of that in, in the paddock here. And they have a lot of flowers that uh, they actually have lots of pollen in their flowers. So great for, um, for pollen, pollen and nectar loving plants. In the middle is uh, one of the Dianellas. Now there's a Dianella, a couple of Dianellas that grow in the bush around here, but there are lots and lots of cultivars. So the horticultural industry has been making, has been developing lots of cultivars. And there are small ones and large ones and blue ones and lots and lots. So I don't know what the number of cultivars is, but 
lots and lots of cultivars. They have good, tough, strappy leaves. Uh, they really drought tolerant, lovely blue flowers, and then they have the purple berries, um, very bright purple berries uh, that, uh, that animals like to eat. And over on the left, I showed you uh, the uh, Lamandra longifolia, the very big, strappy Lamandra. Um, this is one of the cultivars of Lamandra, um, the mat rushes, and there are lots and lots and lots of those as well. Um, lots of cultivars. So lots of our animals need grasses. Um, we've got seed and insect eating birds. So this gorgeous fire tail, um, red browed finch. <laughs> I've got a patch of barnyard grass, which is a summer active weed. Um, and I've got another summer grass. And they're outside my bedroom window. And I kept thinking, I must go and get rid of those. I must get rid of them, rid of them on the path. But every year, I have a whole lot of the uh, fire tails, the red browed finches, coming early and eating all the seed off these uh, weedy grasses. So I don't feel quite as guilty that I haven't um, done anything about it. So uh, they are seed and insect eating birds. But a lot of the birds, as I said, that eat insects also love the grasses. Now, this butterfly on the right-hand side, I saw on my walk this morning, was flitting around the grasses and in the leaf litter. So a lot of them have their larvae in the leaf litter. And I haven't got around to identifying it. I'm sure someone will know it. Just a gorgeous little um, uh, brown and black butterfly or moth. I didn't even get close enough to see whether it was a butterfly or a moth. Things like the, the bottom right is a lace wing, and we have green and brown lace wings and probably lots of others. They're fantastic predators for gardens on things like aphids and a whole lot of different um, insects that we don't actually like lots of in our garden. Um, so lace wings are great. Uh, this uh, lady beetle uh, also relies on grasses and the Jackie Lizard, I just love our Jackie Lizards that live here. They duck in and so lizards love being out um, in the sun, but they need somewhere to hide from if there are kookaburras or other birds. And what they often do is they grow in the, in the tussocks of the grasses. They live in the tussocks of the grasses. They come out and as soon as there's danger, they run back in. Um, and we have lots of these. They also, I've got a photo somewhere that I couldn't find today, of them eating, it's one with a great cabbage white butterfly in its mouth. So they're also fabulous to um, encourage to be in the garden. Um, and we have lots of them and they sit on our posts and get the sun and then they drop down, which gives you a little scare when you first, um, when you first uh, see them. Um, our drop bears are actually drop lizards if you follow that advertisement. We need to be, uh, for someone that's been to my garden recently, my garden's a little bit wild at the moment. I've been very busy and I haven't actually done as much gardening as I'd like. But we, if we want to have wildlife in our garden, we don't want this. I got this off Facebook. This We want less of this. Very few, very few things will live in there. Not many birds. You won't get any gorgeous little birds living in that top one. So we want more diversity and grasses can actually be great for diversity of structure, but also uh, different flowering types and different sorts of flowers. So this, uh, garden, particularly butterflies, love a bit of uh, wild space. So if you are a very neat person, which I wish I had a little bit more of, if you are a very neat person, um, it's actually great somewhere out the back or somewhere where you don't, it doesn't upset your neatness eye is to have a few wild areas. Let something go. Let the grasses or the weeds grow, grow a bit wild. Um, and you will actually find um, things living in there. Uh, so just a nice, even if you don't like having big areas, um, but if you can have some wild places, you will get the caterpillars and the butterflies and the birds and um, coming in and using them. Where do we get them? Where do we get these native grasses and sedges? 
Uh, you can propagate them yourself by seed, um, and we can collect. Now is actually a pretty good time to be collecting seed um, by division. So if you look at the top pile, that is a clumping grass that has been cut back. And yes, they're getting um, the shovel in and digging it up and then dividing it and then moving it around. I actually use sometimes a tomahawk or something or a really old bread, uh, bread knife. So you can be pretty tough with these. So these grasses and sedges um, uh, have mass roots um, and multiple growing points. So we can actually divide them and get a lot more uh, plants out of them. We could either put them into pots or um, we can direct transplant them to other areas in our garden. And it's a really cost-effective way of getting lots of plants, but also getting some mass planting. Um, and it also keeps them looking good rather than a bit too ratty. Um, now there's, so we can do them by seed or division, not really by cuttings. But there are two uh, fabulous nurseries around here. We've got our native nursery in Wodonga. Um, now that is a community run nursery um, that was sort of very run down, but some really incredible volunteers have been working in this nursery. You can see a picture here of a display garden, but uh, they've been growing lots of, they collect all these seed locally under permit. Um, or from people's property, uh, and they grow lots of uh, native grasses. So they've got lots of kangaroo grass, poas, sedges. They have that, as I said, about eight plants of that. Cyper uh, um, elegantissima, the elegant spear grass. Um, but they are propagating all the time. And I know if you've got something in particular you'd really like, uh, Liz will um, propagate for you if she's got the seed. So. Fabulous local one in Wodonga. Um, look at their website or Facebook. Um, I think it's Tuesday, Wednesday and Saturdays and also by appointment. Um, and Park Lane Nursery in Wangaratta is another fantastic nursery um, down in Park Lane in Wangaratta. Lots of amazing uh, trees, shrubs, grasses, sedges. Um, you can look at what they have online. Um, on their great website as well, and uh, lots of knowledgeable people at both of those places. Have lots of people who will give you have people who will give you lots of information and help. Um, and so those two are, are great because they collect local native seed and they grow plants that are suitable for our conditions. There are also commercial nurseries. So as I said, lots of the commercial nurseries are now stocking um, cultivars, cultivated varieties of a lot of those sedges and mat brushes and uh, dianellas and grasses. Um, so keep your eye out for those. And there is a lot of work being done on making new cultivars as well. So my resources, you can see that I uh, got, uh, as I said, I've had some major IT issues today, um, but there are an awful lot of um, resources online. There's a couple of books that are different to the ones you might normally get. Something like our Costumans, the book that we use for a lot of native ID around here, doesn't have grasses. Um, so we're often looking for specialist grass books. So Meredith Mitchell, who's been working over at Brother Glen, for a long time in native grasses. There's many, ver there's quite a few versions of this native grasses book if you want to look at it um, for ID. I love this book and it's probably not an easy book to get, The Flying Colours, which is about attracting butterflies and moths to your garden. But a lot of those kids' books are actually really good um, for attracting um, butterflies and things. Lots of information about um, uh, attracting butterflies on the web. There, are, there is even a growing a wallaby grass lawn. If you want to grow a lawn, that'd be a very tough lawn, um, very water, um, not needing much water. Um, 
and there are there's some information about growing a microlene lawn. So there's a few people that have the weeping grass lawn as well. Now we're going to open for questions in tick, uh, but I just want to reiterate: don't forget to have some wild spots um, in your garden. Uh, and how and start. Uh, I'd really like to encourage you to start spending a bit of time just wandering and looking and discovering the beauty in the in the not so bright and bold, or the beauty in the seed heads or the beauty in the insects um, that are attracted to the grasses and the other things in your garden. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you. I forgot to wave this about everyone. This is one of the reasons I'm actually sorry that we're not in person, apart from to be able to interact with you and talk to you, but it's also to, so you can play with the native grasses that I would have brought in. And see, this is a gorgeous clump of kangaroo grass. Um, that is just beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, the audience can see why we keep inviting Sue back time and time again. And you do have the opportunity. I'm going to get in early to let you know that on Saturday, the 19th of March, Sue's going to be giving a presentation. We haven't put any publicity out yet. It'll be coming out soon at a Splitters Creek garden and she'll be talking about garden favourites. Um, Sue, with her wealth of experience, has this treasure trove of information in her head. And what I love about her presentations is that she makes, she has the gift of making this information um, engaging and accessible. So perhaps if everyone could quickly turn on their videos and then we can see some of your faces and we could do a final waving goodbye and I thank all of you the, the chat function just has been going the whole time Sue um, to thank all of you who have tuned in this evening we hope you've come away with some new ideas and um, inspiration for your garden so and thanks so much you. Lizette thanks so much Lizette for all your work um, and great My pleasure thank you everyone. And thanks everyone thank you very much